Good evening. Tonight, dying with dignity or dangerous social experiment. We look at the Holland experience with voluntary euthanasia and talk to a leading New Zealand lawyer who's suffering a terminal illness and wants the right to an assisted suicide. I would die at home. I would have had a lovely meal and I would have my family and my husband and my cat around me. Finding consensus on the morally charged question of voluntary euthanasia has been attempted in jurisdictions around the world. For most Australians, the difference seems to lie more in the detail, not the principle. At various times over the past two decades, polling companies Morgan and NewsPoll have asked this question. Thinking about voluntary euthanasia, if a hopelessly ill patient experiencing unrelievable suffering with absolutely no chance of recovering asks for a lethal dose, should a doctor be allowed to provide a lethal dose. In 2002, 73% said yes. A decade later, 82.5% said yes to the same question. But that question outlines a very specific set of circumstances. So can you achieve a law that allows certain cases to go ahead while also protecting the vulnerable? It was a challenge raised during the fight over the Northern Territory's euthanasia laws in the mid-90s. Someone you know or love may choose death by mistake. Once you allow intentional killing and assisted suicide, you cross a line and thereafter it's uh, virtually impossible to draw another line. Laws were passed in the Territory allowing for doctor-assisted suicide, but the Federal Parliament overruled them. Tasmania went close to introducing voluntary euthanasia in 2013, but fell two votes short in the lower house. So Australia has had to look overseas to see how things work in practice. Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Switzerland and a handful of US states already allow for voluntary euthanasia. And now Canada is set to join them. For an incurably ill Canadian suffering unbearable pain, the choice has long been clear. Endure or take their own life. Today, this country's top court called that choice cruel, struck down the laws that created it and opened the door to a third option, doctor-assisted death. The court has given Canada's provincial and federal parliaments a year to craft those new laws with strong caveats and regulation. Canadian MPs might look at the Dutch system for ideas. The Netherlands was the first country to legalise voluntary euthanasia and rates there are soaring. A record 5,400 people took their own life with a doctor's help last year. Under Dutch law, for patients suffering needs the, the patient's suffering needs to be prolonged, unbearable and hopeless, and all requests must be approved by a review committee. Even so, the growing number of patients choosing to die has made some people wonder if things have gone too far. Europe correspondent Barbara Miller travelled to the Netherlands for this report. For, for 10 years, whenever I was passing by the flats, because on the highway you can already see the flats in the, in the distance, I really thought the mere thought of going there already made me want to vomit. Elena Lindemans is taking us to the place her mother ended her life in 2002. My mom really had a long, persistent wish to die. It was not something that came up spontaneously once in a while. It was there all the time. All the conversations we had, especially in the last year, was all about that she wanted to die. A law legalising euthanasia was introduced several months after Elena's mother committed suicide. For her, it came too late. Then in a way you are forced to, to do a med medieval practice, like jumping up an apartment building. And so it was over here. Yeah, literally there at the curb. Um, the janitor told me that it was, because she jumped from the 11th floor over there. Wow. Uh, and she came down here. Elena Lindemans, who made a documentary about her experience, thinks her mother should have been granted euthanasia because her suffering from what's now believed to have been stress-related disorder was so intense. A lovely smile. She has a lovely smile. I haven't seen this picture again for, for a long time. A trip to Australia didn't, as Elena had hoped, cure her mother. This is the picture we took just before we left. It's in Amsterdam. 
And this is the picture of the toilets at the airport at Sydney when we just arrived. Those were the hardest 24 hours ever in my life. It's better to take six babies with you on the plane than your mother who's so sick. The number of Dutch people opting for euthanasia is on the increase. In 2014, for the first time, the figure crossed the 5,000 mark. Many of those who choose to die are terminally ill, but a small and increasing minority are patients with psychiatric issues or dementia. It was difficult for him, and so my sister and uh, my younger brother. In this unremarkable living room near Arnhem, south of Amsterdam, something extraordinary happened. Something that in Australia could land you a jail term. Siep Pietersma, a 79-year-old former driving instructor with dementia, killed himself with the help of a doctor. Siep Pietersma had been diagnosed with dementia and the illness was taking hold. He'd watched his mother lose her mind and lived in fear of ending the same way. His mother had a lot of pain, didn't know where she was. She couldn't move right. Uh, she wanted to die. With his wife of 60 years, Sieg Pietersma carefully planned his death. The whole family came to the farewell party. At her husband's request, his wife even sang a little. You sang, we'll meet again. Yeah, we'll meet again. And he took his drink and then he said, I'm sleepy. I hold him on his knees. Them. Yeah. And she helped him uh, to, to, to leave uh, uh, his life. Oh, it's very difficult it's losing your cold. father. It's very emotional. I, 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 at the moment he, the, his dying was yeah. closing, uh, I wasn't able to say the things I, I, I want to say to him. But I was happy for him that his wish was granted. Chef Burston is the man who helped Siep Pietersma die. He works for the End of Life Clinic, a network of around 50 doctors and nurses who will go where other doctors won't, giving euthanasia to patients who've been refused it by their local GP. The End of Life Clinic doctors must decide if, as the law stipulates, the patient's suffering is unbearable. I like that job. How oh. Strange it, it, it sounds, but, but I like it, to help people. That is my whole GP life, helping people. And you say you've done this 60 times in, in three, two and a half uh, years? Two, two three. And a, yeah, I think, yeah. And there, there's much asking for, but there's a, a waiting list uh, by, the, by the clinic. Professor Theo Boer used to support the euthanasia law. I was convinced uh, that the law that we had at that time, uh, which, was the first, which was the first in the world to uh, legalize euthanasia, uh, was a good law, that it was a balanced law, that it was a respectful compromise. But now he's losing faith in it. I think this law may have created its own demand. The euthanasia law was meant to be a last resort. Uh, what we see now is that to some people, increasingly, euthanasia is becoming a preferred way to die. Theo Boer says other jurisdictions should think long and hard before introducing euthanasia laws. Don't follow the Dutch example. I wouldn't say don't organize it, don't legalize it, but, but do it in a different way. Uh, in hindsight, you can say about Holland that this, the criteria uh, are much, much to lose. Uh, in fact, on the basis of our law, basically anything goes. I'm not saying that everyone who's asking for euthanasia should have euthanasia. On the contrary, you have to look at all individual cases. But my mom was sick for 10, 11 years. And if you suffer such a long time and you have a long persistence um, wish to die, then I think you should listen to a person. I'm, I'm, I'm not proud, this is not the word, but I'm satisfied with, with the whole family. That it's, it's marvelous to do that. And if you see that literally life is hurting her so much, literally every single meter in the house was, was, was too much for her. Then at the end, if you love someone, you set them free. 
Closer to home in New Zealand, the High Court will next month hear a challenge to the blanket prohibition on assisted suicide. The lawyer filing that claim is Lucretia Seals. She's a senior legal and policy advisor at the New Zealand Law Commission. Beyond the legal argument, Lucretia Seals has a very personal stake in the fight. She has terminal brain cancer and she spoke to me from New Zealand. Lucretia Seals, welcome to Late Line. Good evening. Can you please tell us about your illness, when you were diagnosed and how you're feeling today? In 2011, I was diagnosed with a diffuse astrocytoma grade 2 brain tumour. And tell us how the illness has progressed for you. How are you today? Um, well, I'm pretty good, actually. I have partial paralysis in my left arm, hand, in my left leg and foot. Um, but, you know, I can live with that. And so what have the doctors told you about your prospects going forward? Well, it's really very hard for them to say because everybody's different and all tumours are different and grow slightly differently, but um, most likely they've said to me um, that, um, you know, there is no cure, um, but that it, it might happen quickly or it might happen really slowly and they just can't tell. Just depends which tentacle of tumour um, grows quickest. If the decision was yours about where and when you would die, what choices would you make? I would die at home. I would have had a lovely meal and I would have my family and my husband and my cat around me. And when? When? Um, when I felt that my state was unbearable or when I couldn't recognise people who, lo who I love. You know, if, when I lo if I lose my mental faculties, I don't want to be alive because that's not who I am. With the New Zealand laws as they are now, what yes. choices are available to you? Basically, committing suicide now while I'm physically able to or um, just refusing um, food and so on. I understand you filed a statement in the High Court. What are the legal arguments? Well, the legal arguments are that um, the Crimes Act 1961 needs to be interpreted in the light of the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act 1990. And um, in the Crimes Act, there is no definition of suicide, um, but it is unlawful to aid or abet a person's suicide. And the view has generally been taken that that means um, that doctors can't assist a patient to die. Um, but we, so we're going to clarify that meaning. What would you like inserted into the legislation? How would you like that meaning clarified? Well, it, well, I would like it clarified to make it clear that it is the patient's choice um, whether, um, whether life is too uncomfortable or not. And not the doctors, not, um, not a family members. Um, I would like to see a proper framework in place for enabling people um, who are terminal to seek assistance to die in a dignified manner. And that would need to have safeguards around it. Now you talk about life becoming too uncomfortable. If there were any prospect of survival, say a medical breakthrough, would that change your mind? Um, well, that's very hypothetical. Um, 
but so I but I don't think so. I don't think so. And who do you believe should have access to life-ending drugs? Should it be only adults and only those uh, in the only co only competent adults? And only terminally ill patients or also perhaps people who suffer, say, dementia or depression, which are allowed in Switzerland, for instance? Uh, dementia, I would say yes. Depression, I'd say no. But all those sorts of details would have to be specified in the legislation, wouldn't they? Well, probably. I think it should be... Um you know, the quality of life from the patient's point of view. What safeguards do you think you'd need in any legislation allowing euthanasia to ensure, for instance, that the elderly or the vulnerable are not put under intolerable pressure to agree to end their lives? Well, I think a person's GP and perhaps another doctor should... Um, you should have to ask for it more than once. The doctor should be satisfied that there is no coercion and um, every time it's used it should be reported on and you know there should be a review of instances where it is used. Isn't there a risk that if a country like New Zealand were to act unilaterally that you open up the possibility that the country becomes a, a destination for suicide tourism? Well, not if you're... It, it can't if your legislation specifies that you have to be normally resident or, you know, a citizen. Do you think that should be a necessity of any law that might get passed or um, insertion into existing legislation in New Zealand? I'm not sure about that, actually. Um, to some degree, I do, but um, some people aren't lucky enough to live in countries like New Zealand. You're a lawyer and a policy advisor to the New Zealand Law Commission. Did you have specific views on this issue before your own diagnosis? No, I didn't. I hadn't ever really thought about it. Polls show most New Zealanders support assisted dying for the terminally ill. So how do you explain why politicians are so reluctant to act? <laughs> Some of them grew up Catholic. I think it's, it's... Yes, polls do show that, but it's a very divisive issue and um, not everyone thinks the same way on it. So although actually most people do think the same way, there are a vociferous minority who don't, and that scares politicians. What are the prospects of success when it comes to your High Court challenge? I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic, actually. I think, I think we've got a good case. It's quite exciting. When will it be heard? Um, the hearing will start, I think, on 25 May. You mentioned earlier when I asked you about the options that are currently open to you under existing laws, if your challenge is unsuccessful, would you actually consider going the way of another New Zealand woman, Margaret Page, who did in fact starve herself to death over 16 days? Is that something you've considered? It's something I've considered and it's something I don't want to do because it's not a nice death, it's a long, drawn-out, painful one. And finally, Lucretia, can I ask you, do you fear death? No, I don't fear death. I fear what might happen to me in the lead-up to my death but not dying itself. What do you mean when you refer to the lead-up to your death? The state of my I might be in and the length of time it might take for me to finally die. What does your family think about this campaign that you're now involved in? <laughs> they agree with it in principle, but would struggle if I actually made that decision. Of course they would struggle, but um, in, in principle, they do agree with it, and I've talked to them about it. 
Lucretia Seals, I thank you so very much for taking the time to come in and speak to us. I know you're not really very well, so we do appreciate very much that you've made the effort to come and speak to us. Thank you. Thank you. And if you or someone close to you are in need of help or advice, you can call Lifeline on 13 11 14 or Beyond Blue on 1300 226 36.